This is an Nexus Special, Episode 42, New Year's Eve 2015, on December 28th, 2015. This episode of the Nexus Special is hosted by Ian Buck, Ian Decker, and your host, Ryan Rampersad. So this Nexus Special is a little bit different than uh, most of the other Nexus Specials that were year-end ones, because Ian Decker and I are here, which is not the norm. Well, I think this is actually the first time I've been available to do a year-end special. Yeah, yeah, I tend to be traveling to, like, Iowa or whatever, where T-Mobile dares not tread. The And then, yeah, I don't know, I don't even know what you're doing. I think I've been on every New Year special, but I think there are certain reasons for that. Yeah, you are the network. Oh, man, I wish I wasn't the whole network. Uh, it is unfortunate that others could not join us today, such as Brian Mitchell, Brandon Johnson, and Andrew Bailey. So let's begin with uh, USB Type-C then, because that's what we have first here on the list. Okay, so USB Type-C came out. Well, we, we first started seeing devices using it this year. Yes. Um, I think so far we have approximately five of them. Wow. It's uh, like none. There's there's a couple of laptops, the, uh, the Chromebook Pixel 2. Whatever uh, did they yeah. put the whatever? Yeah, let's go with that. Um, and then the the new MacBook, MacBook One. Uh, is that actually what they call no, it? No, but Please that's no. what we call it here. Okay. Uh, and then we had the One Plus Two, uh, right. for which was a smartphone, and uh, the two Nexuses this year, the Nexus Six P and the Five X. Those have USB Type C. Now let's let's how many cables of Type C exist in the world? The answer is just five. Also, okay. Yeah, there's only five cables for everyone to share in the world. And I'm looking forward to the future where, yeah, USB Type-C is basically what we use for every device ever. Um, we'll see if it actually comes true. I'm, I'm hoping that it does. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a tough uphill battle both ways. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any Type-C devices here. I'm already feeling the weird transition phase where I'm like, okay, so I've got a tablet that uses micro USB and I've got my phone now that uses USB Type-C. And if I want to be able to use my... Uh, my charger battery for both of them. I have to have two different cables with me. And it's, you know, it's yeah. a very difficult transitionary period. You know, Apple kind of just went through this between 30 pin and lightning. Mm, mm-hmm. And, you know, Apple surely knows best for their customers. Right. Right. Sh- sure. Yeah. So, I mean, in theory, they knew that it wouldn't kill everyone to transfer over. But I think for Android people, USB micro micro USB, was so cheap. You could buy a cable for a dollar and it would true. and it would just work. Type C seems to be more expensive and relatively rare right now, and I feel like it'll never be cheap enough to make all of this worth it. It's kind of hard to call that already though because it's so new and it's it's hard to know cuz I mean like micro USB when that first came out, it de- they definitely weren't cables for a dollar cuz it was new and revolutionary. I don't crazy. know, man. I feel like I could have been purchasing micro USB cables for a long time for very cheap. If only we had some correspondent in the future who could come back in time and tell us how it all turned out. So out. all of us in uh, two years. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm, at least. Watch, we'll listen to this in two years. And so go, I think wow, that rolls right into our Google section pretty well. It does. It does. Um, so Google, obviously, they uh, they came out with a couple of new Nexuses. Um, actually, two new phones this year. Is Which is un- unusual. Yeah, it's unusual for them. Um, but I think it was the right call definitely because they, it allowed them to, uh, hit both markets of, you know, people who two years ago got the Nexus five and were really happy with it. Um, and people last year who got the Nexus six and were like, yeah, I like big phones and I cannot lie. Um, it's not what I thought you were going to go for. Like I thought you were going to go for, they got the Nexus five and they liked it and they got the Nexus six and didn't like it. But that's what you were going to go. Oh, for. well, I'm, I'm naming two different groups of people. I understand. Yeah. And there's only two groups of people. <laughs> The people who didn't like the Nexus 6 and the people who didn't like the Nexus 6. <laughs> <laughs> Says the guy with the Nexus 6. Who, Two Nexus 6. Yeah, you decided to get a second one for some reason. I because. Don't um, but yeah, so so coming out with two phones, uh, man, you know, hits both of those preferences. Um, the big phones and the, the medium phones. Right. Um, but they did it in such a way that like the smaller, cheaper one didn't get completely gypped on on parts you know just just uh it it was a fair compromise between price and parts Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think the camera modules are the same is that right yeah i think uh it is just missing optical symbols optical image stabilization neither neither have optical oh as far as i know the only difference between 
the parts internally is the processor, and that's just an 808 or an 810. Okay. So, you know, again, Qualcomm sucks, but, you know, at least, uh, you know... They're the lesser of all of the evils. Right. No, maybe. Maybe. Um, so, speaking of uh, the Nexus phones, that's when they come out with new versions of Android. Um, and Android 6 has... Uh, it's a really, really good version of Android. It we, seemed fairly solid. Mm-hmm, no, no critical bugs that we're aware of at this point. Um, not the way that that memory leak was last year. So I think we're we're at six point zero point one right now. Yep. As of New Year's Eve, wink, wink. And now, if you listen to this in the past, but in the future, it will still be true. So last time we had a major Android update, that was the five branch. There were numerous bug fixes and they were all late to all devices. And it was just, just, just a road wreck of broken memory leaks and broken updates and just broken brokenness. But man, did that material look good? Maybe it does, but it doesn't matter if I have no memory to run it. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. So what else did Google do this year uh, or well, not do? Yeah, one thing, oh my gosh, that I thought for sure that they were going to do with uh, Android 6.0 was introduce uh, split-screen multitasking to Android. Um, and so the reason we thought this is earlier this year, we were told that a new device called the Pixel C would be coming out. Mm -hmm. And the Pixel C was a device with a special screen ratio for two things to be open in the same ratio as one portrait or two side-by-side -side with the same ratio. It's the square root of blah, blah, blah. Sure. And guess what? Android does not implement any of these features to do side-by-side -side multitasking or any other feature to enhance that. It's It's got to be like on the way, but they just didn't have it ready in time. That's the only explanation. And I now they're of. going to do what? Delay until Google I.O. in know. 2016? I don't know. This is either a sign of Qualcomm's incompetence spreading or... <laughs> You're just never going to let it go. <laughs> or they missed a major milestone and have been set back massively. I don't know if you've ever programmed any Google apps or Android apps, I mean. No. No. I have done a tad bit. Uh, I have made one slight app. And I would probably say to you, as a person implementing those APIs, that it might be difficult to make a good universal method for having split screen. And then having those apps know that they're split screen. Mm -hmm. So traditionally in Android, the app is the only thing on the screen, and that's it. Right. In every Unless there's something else drawing over with bubbles. Right. And so the bubble thing, that's a hack. It's not something the system exposes for people to actually do. Yep. It's just a miracle it works. So I'm sure Google is taking a very long and heavy-handed approach to doing it because whatever Samsung did only works with some apps some of the time. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. get it. But they need to have done this years ago. Yeah. Apple has it now on all the devices except the iPhone. Of course, that's the thing I wanted on one on my phone. But at least they have it on their iPads. Yeah, yeah. And and generally, when like one of the manufacturers has something that they put in their skin of Android that seems like a really good idea, um, Google will incorporate that into core Android within like a year or two. Sometimes, it's yeah. It's been a really, really long time since Samsung first introduced split-screen multitasking to like the Galaxy Note. I mean, whatever. I can think of other things like the rearrangeable um, quick notification. Oh, quick the quick shape, settings? Quick settings. Mm -hmm. That took years of struggle to get. Do, and, do you and, remember when the first Android 4.4 came out? Or one of the one of, one of the four branches came out. They didn't have where you could long press on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to turn it on or off, you had to actually go in to do it. And then suddenly mm. in a point update, they had it. And then suddenly in the next version, it was gone again and then reintroduced. Google doesn't that. have any clue what they're doing with their operating system, just like Qualcomm doesn't know what they're doing with their chips. Well, something that we can hope that they know what they're doing uh, is with their routers, which they just got into that market. What a strange thing. Yeah. Um, so... OnHub is uh, Google's line of, of home internet routers. Uh, they first, let's see, the first one was with Asus, right? Uh, I don't no, know for sure. No, no, sorry, uh, Asus was the second one. The first one was TP-Link. Um, so kind of like kind of like their Nexus phones, they partner with an existing like hardware manufacturer, and then um, the I guess the routers just kind of share a, a common software base, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 
they're supposed to be like the future of routers because they're going to do a much better job of keeping these things always up to date um, and give them kind of more modern like features that we would expect from from a modern device, like being able to interact with it from from an app, from the Internet, from anywhere that we that we are online. Um, it's I mean, it, it feels weird to call it like a smart router, but that's essentially what they're what they're doing here. Right. I mean, so I guess I'd have to see what the software is like and actually try one. They're kind of expensive, mm-hmm, like two hundred some dollars. They're, they're, I think one is one ninety nine and the other is two nineteen. Yep. It's 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 somewhat expensive, I think, for a person just to say, "Hey, I want to do router. I'm going to take a total chance on this Google thing." I mean, unless you're already in the ecosystem, you already have four Nexuses or two Nexus sixes. Yeah. You probably won't get this. No. Um, now I wonder if this is sort of also an evolution out of um like um their fiber rollouts, like. Hey, you know, maybe uh, maybe you can just give these people a router when they buy fiber. Cool, great. Hmm. You know, they were probably giving something to those people anyway, and now they just have a first branded thing to do it with. Something other than uh, Lego, yeah, uh, sets to put your Nexus Six on, right? <laughs> but that's that that was awesome though. But yeah, you cannot deny that. Yeah, I really, <laughs> really am jealous of that actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I guess I guess this is also their first Brillo device. I don't know if you remember Brillo, oh, right. but Brillo is their home automation framework or protocol or Internet some, of Things thing. Some joke terminology that means nothing in the long run. I don't think it matters. It's, it's not good enough. Just like Android Wear, you know, it's it's these side projects that try to make the news, but then just don't even come close mm-hmm. to doing it. And actually, it was it was interesting timing uh, because we just moved into a house and, you know, just started service with uh, CenturyLink. Mm-hmm. And of course, the router that CenturyLink gave us is crap. Um, so we had to get another router, but, you know, we, we went with like a uh, Netgear, yeah. um, you know, kind of gray square yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Black square. Whatever. It's a square. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Shape that, that counts. It, w- it would have been interesting to try out an on hub, um, but I didn't. But have again, the, cash the, the, the price time. is right. is is just too high. Yeah. Now I wonder if in that price does it really make a difference? Does two hundred dollars worth of router really make a difference? Hard to say without yeah. trying them side by side. Exactly. But there are so many other um, variables that you can blame when you're getting like moldy walls. Ter- <laughs> sure. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, we did have that problem too. Yeah, I know. Uh, we fixed that problem. Now something that. Uh, is not too high a price, in my opinion, is YouTube Red, um, which Google launched uh, fairly recently. Yeah, a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, and when they when they first announced it, you know, it was just announced as this ten dollars a month thing, um, where you would get ad free YouTube and then a few other features like on the mobile version. Right. So you would be able to do like background YouTube videos, which mm-hmm. is cool, but probably not worth ten dollars alone. Right. Um, but it, they also said kind of on the side, oh yeah, you also get, uh, access to Google music, all access and, and, um, oh, and, and those of you who have Google music, all access, you get YouTube red as well. Um, and so now suddenly this, this proposition of getting all the music you could want and no more awful ads on YouTube. What a great deal, but it gets better. It gets better because, uh, just in time for the holiday season, they came out with their family plan for Google Music All Access, uh, which is $15 a month for five accounts to have access to, uh, Google Music All Access, which also includes YouTube Red. So I think that is by far the best deal in, in streaming. Uh, in in existence right I mean, now. I mean, I mean, it depends on the kind of content you want. But if you watch enough YouTube to be annoyed by the ads as much as I do, then yes, it's almost certainly mm-hmm. worth it. Um, and I mean, you you think about like the competing music streaming um deals, right? Is they're almost all roughly ten dollars a month, right? Um, and they give you, you know, music, music without ads and, and some form of control over what you're going to be listening to. Right. right. Um, so some of them do have a family plan, $15 a month for five lines. Yep. But none of them also have YouTube. None of them also give you access to Netflix, or, you know, or whatever. You know, it's a gr- it's a great proposition. And it seems kind of strange that Google isn't making a bigger deal about that. Mm-hmm. So I think. I think hopefully they make a bigger deal about that in the next coming year, and um, I'm pretty pretty happy that they decided to do this. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was and it it was good for me as well because uh, I was able to do most of my Christmas shopping for my nuclear family right then and there. 
Right. I just kind of figured out who likes music and who doesn't. And okay, those of them who like music get access to the family plan, and that's their what purchase a good deal. present for the year. What a what a wonderful thing. Yep. Yeah. So let's see. Let's go on to Apple. Unfortunately, we don't have any of our Apple knowledgeable people here. Mm-hmm. So I will have to do my best. I don't even know what the Apple Watch is called. Is that right? That was right. Oh, okay. That's correct. So this year, guess what happened? Apple released a watch. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's the I. I, I watch. No, it's the Apple Watch. And um, there's two kinds. People wear them. People have them. Sales are nothing to write home about, but they're fine. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Um, I mean, I haven't had any direct uh, interactions with one, I think. I don't think I've ever actually seen one in real life. Mm-hmm. Come to think and that's pretty much my uh, opinion about it. I mean, I, I've seen it in real life. I've seen Brandon wearing it. I've seen mm-hmm. Brandon wearing it. But it's not something that's noticeable that, you know, you can see a person playing with their iPhone. You can see a person playing with their Nexus 6. You can see a person playing with their uh, 5X. You can actually see people with phones. But nobody actually uses their watch. Turns mm-hmm. out watches are just something you have on you. That's it. Actually, I take it back. Uh, the Apple employee who was helping with the training for the Just iPads don't, for the teachers, don't. she had uh, an Apple Watch on. Does that even count? And, uh, probably not. She also had an iPad Pro. Yeah, and she was probably so. wearing a black turtleneck, too. <laughs> Gosh, she might have been. Uh, <laughs> speaking of the iPad Pro, that also came out this year. Oh, man. Yeah. I can't believe I forgot a Pro line product. Oh, wait. It's because it's useless. So the Apple iPad Pro... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Can you can you can, how can you even justify their naming at this point? Uh, well, it is getting a little bit confusing. Okay, so the, the wait till we get Pro. to iMusic. Uh, someone is called. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the the iPad Pro is is a fairly good iPad. It it has four gigabytes of memory. It has a gigantic screen to cover a MacBook Air. I think that's what twelve and a bit. Twelve like twelve point six or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty big, and it it's a lovely device. It has speakers that are great. Everything about it is wonderful in terms of its processor. It actually works, unlike some Qualcomm products I might know about. For example, it beats every other processor out on the market right now in both CPU performance and GPU performance. Mm-hmm. So what what else could you want? Well, you could maybe, I suppose, want something to do with it. Uh, it turns out that there's not a lot of product- productivity you can actually do on an iPad. You know, some people who, I guess, write might get some productivity, but the whole point of the iPad Pro was to use the little pen thing. and uh, Which is another $100. Which is another $100, and the little keyboard thing, which is another $150. So what do you do with it? I don't know. I mean, honestly, if I was if, if I wanted something to use like the pen with for drawing or whatever, I would probably just get a uh, Microsoft service. And I think that would be the better choice because you would get the best of both worlds. You'd be able to use it as a tablet and a laptop and a drawing surface, mm-hmm. which is funny because it's called the surface. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't think that they did that on purpose now, did you? No, I don't think so, because uh, that'd be too smart for Microsoft. <laughs> Could also just be, you know, a really fancy doormat. You know, speaking of, you know, funny products uh, in the tablet and laptop form factor, the MacBook One, which is actually just called the MacBook in real life, mm-hmm. what a weird thing. It is that Apple product that charges with USB, USB Type-C. Type-C, which makes no sense because they have their own proprietary phone connector, which is Lightning, but they also have their other connector called Thunderbolt. Why doesn't anything line up with Apple at this point? I don't know. I mean, I'm glad, I was glad to see that they were making a laptop that charges with USB Type-C because um, to me it kind of, it sent the message that Apple is willing to play uh, on everybody else's terms. I think I will agree to that point if they make their following products also charge over Type-C. Yeah. If they don't, that's false. I I almost thought that it meant that their next iPhones were going to be uh, USB Type-C. It's too early for it's that, yeah. too early, yeah. Yeah, that, that'll have to be in like six more years. <laughs> I mean that 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 I mean I guess we could maybe say five, but that's that's optimistic. Mm. Before Type D is discovered, <laughs> slash invented, maybe I want the D. I mean I guess I guess my other problem with the MacBook One is its processor. Intel makes great processors when they're an i5 and i7, but a Core right. processor just isn't very good. The MacBook Air that I have is faster than that. Oh really? Yeah. Pretty uh, much. Okay, so the the MacBook Air after mine, the 2012 is is, is as fast as the Core M. Mm-hmm. So that was released in 2015. So a three year old laptop was faster. So is it processor? or Is it hard drive? It's it's the processor speed. Okay, and it's and it's such a shame that they 
still charge a thousand twelve hundred twelve ninety nine for it, and it's not as fast as the thousand dollar product. Mm-hmm. And mm. uh, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that, and I and I don't. Yeah, I mean the I guess the uh, the appeal of it is that it is it it is thinner and, and smaller it, it is and lighter and than smaller. the air. It also has an awesome keyboard, but it has a super duper great screen. Mm-hmm. So you know it's high resolution and high yep. DPI. So there's that. But I don't I don't know who it's for. It's if you wanted not a MacBook, then why didn't you get the iPad Pro? But it wasn't out yet. But now it is. If you wanted a real computer, why didn't you just get a real computer? Yeah, so to me, I mean, the the new MacBook uh, is appealing because I have gotten very used to the lifestyle of I've got my desktop at home for serious things, and I have my really light, mm-hmm. cheap uh, Chromebook that's that lasts a long time on battery. It's funny how for it, for everything the else. MacBook One isn't cheap though. No, it's not cheap. It's a very expensive Chromebook. Yeah. Um, and if I wanted a very expensive Chromebook, I could also get the Chromebook Pixel. Right. I don't know. I think it's just kind of a lost product in the lineup right now. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, maybe in 2016 it'll change. I don't know. Could be. Yeah. So 3D Touch is that? Is that? Um, yeah, that's that was kind of the big uh, headline feature of the of the, um, phones. the iPhone 6s and 6s Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like it, it's it's like long pressing plus. <laughs> <laughs> I hate myself too. Okay. Um, so, so basically, you know, you, you, you press on the screen, but then you can also kind of squeeze a little bit harder, push your finger down into the screen, and more options will pop up for you. Um, so the, 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 big, the big example of that is that uh, for the camera, when, they, uh, when it takes pictures, it will take like a kind of a brief video of yeah. just before and after you hit the shutter. Um, and it... Uh, um, when you're looking at those photos, you can 3D push on them to see that that before and after. Mm-hmm. Um, also, when you're on like the home screen, um, if an app has enabled 3D touch for for their icon, um, you can 3D touch on on the icon, and it will come up with uh, kind of shortcuts into different parts of the app. So like, right? Um, oh gosh, now I'm trying to think of like a, an example. So I don't know, maybe Facebook, you want to go straight into writing a post. Right. Um, uh, I think I saw something like in notes, you could go right into notes, the composition page. In mail, you could go right to the composition of mail, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So it's shortcuts to discrete actions within apps. Yep. For Facebook, it's... Nobody can see your hand, Ian. Oh, fine. I'm flicking off the screen. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I guess Ryan couldn't see your finger either because it's on the <laughs> other side of the monitor. That's funny. So Apple Music also came out this year. Yeah, I don't remember anything about it. You know, it's people, a streaming service. So, so it's 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 a streaming service, but also also a radio station included. Kind of, yeah. And I guess it's cool for some people um, who are in the iOS landscape, but also for those in the Android landscape because there's also an Android app that Apple made for those poor Android losers, which is the first time ever that i think apple has done that on android as far as i know that is true mm-hmm. so i guess that's good uh you know everybody is making the same deals with the same agencies to stream the same music mm-hmm. so it's 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 hard to be competitive and youtube found a way to do it with their combination of red and google play mm-hmm. music and apple did it by combining um apple with something else yeah yeah actual djs or something something for, like that I don't, I don't know. yeah um so it feels cool. too much like terrestrial radio to me, which is something that I don't like. But I guess other people like it. Yeah, some people really like the ability to not have to deal with all the technical aspects of choosing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Choice is hard. Yeah, especially when it's a you know the the computer gives you a list of like genres, and you're like, I've never even heard it. What does that mean? What does that mean? I don't understand. Right. That's more like me in the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, but maybe you'll know about this section. Yeah, a little bit. One so would hope. Gaming. Um, so the first thing that, that I put down for gaming is the Steam Controller and Steam Machines finally, finally, finally came out. I feel like we've been talking about those for, for like years. two years. I yeah. Um, we, we've just been following the development stages. It's true. That's all. It's mm-hmm. true. Um, which is I probably, I think we get to do that more in gaming than in most other uh, areas. I mean, you know, look at Watch Dogs, for example. Took years for that to come out. Yeah. And it was originally called Nexus, wasn't it? I don't know. Something like that. And it was also originally awful. 
And, and it was finally, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so so the Steam Controller and the Steam Machines have been released. Uh, we, in our house, have a Steam Controller. Yes, sir, we uh, Have you had the opportunity to try it out very much, Ian? A little bit. I Yes, remember I was trying Amnesia on it? Oh, right. Picking up the broom and mm-hmm. throwing the broom. Um, so that was a game, a uh, first-person game, that uh, I'm pretty sure was only built with keyboard and mouse in mind. I don't think yeah. it had any controller support. So how did it feel to you? Um, it was clunky. Mm. Well, uh, are you talking about the controller or the game ported over to controller? Both. Both. The, for the game ported over to controller, it felt really clunky just because, the, as you said, the, the control scheme wasn't really set up in such a way that you could do it much with anything other than keyboard and mouse. Mm-hmm. Like when you're trying to pick up an item and, and interact with an item, which includes opening up a door, mm-hmm. you have to... um press the, down the trigger, which would usually be sort of the fire button. Yep. Um, and then move your, your right, your, your right thumb, which would usually make you move, move your head one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I guess it's similar to, um, to the keyboard and mouse aspect in that way, but it works much better on keyboard and mouse just cause it's a little bit more spatial. Um, like you can move your mouse forward and then the door opens forward or you can move your mouse back and the, mm-hmm. Um, gotcha, it, right, because the in the game, your character is supposedly moving his hand forward or backward to move the yeah. the door, so you're doing the exact same thing with your hand. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, with the Steam controller itself, it wasn't necessarily as bad, because, you know, you have the big radial disc, mm-hmm. which you get to move your finger on, so it's it, it's a little bit more um, tactile. And it does have that, that very subtle haptic feedback as they call it where <laughs> yeah. it, it gives you a little vibrations that feels like you're running your finger over bumps good vibrations yep. <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean the controller itself very nice design mm-hmm. um feels good in the hands it looks really weird but it feels good once you're holding it yeah yeah um i do like the fact that it is a little feels like it's a little bit more omnidirectional mm-hmm than the other just standard joy- joystick controller, which, yeah, you can move it around, but it, it's also, I don't know, it felt like it was hard to get, um, I don't know, I guess I guess with the bigger radius. Um, you can you, you feel like you have more freedom with your thumb because you can move it all the way, like an inch, it's got an inch of radius, I think, on that, yeah. on that uh, trackpad. Yeah, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I like the Steam controller. I think, how much did we, how much did you pay for it? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think it must have been around sixty bucks. That seems like yeah. it's a little. That it was fifty nine. Hmm? That it was fifty nine dollars. Yeah. Fifty nine ninety nine. That that's what I it round. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, seems about right. Which is a, it, it's about the same price as you would pay for a first party controller for you know most consoles and yeah that club you know, platform or mm-hmm. that finesseful platform. And I and I definitely think that it matches them in quality. Yes, most um, definitely. Okay, yeah, I guess if we're looking at products of the same kind, then yes, I, I do like the Steam controller, and I think that it is a good price. Mm-hmm. But I also am thinking of my off-brand controller, which I got for 30 bucks at GameStop. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, we, we've got some $25 uh, Logitech controllers um, sitting under the television as well. And those definitely feel like $25 controllers. You know, they yeah. don't have rumble mm-hmm. capabilities. They uh, are very, very basic. Um, gosh, I should have gotten that $5 upgrade, shouldn't I? I know. <laughs> yeah, you should have. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that $5 rumble. Um, yeah, I've used the, uh, Steam controller for a few games, some of them that had controllers in mind, some of them, um, that did not. Uh, the one that I was actually especially surprised that I really enjoyed was Civilization V, hmm. um, because it, w- once you got used to the control scheme and where all of the buttons were, um, it worked marvelously. Um, you just kind of had to wrap your head around the fact that uh, left click was on the right side of the controller and right click was on the left side of the controller. Well, that's messed up. Um, well, but it, it makes sense from the perspective of your uh, index finger on your right hand should always be the left click. Yeah, okay. Right? That's fine. Um, so, it, so right trigger becomes that. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the, the trackpads do different things and the face buttons and the, and the grip uh, buttons do different things. Oh, yeah, there's grip buttons. I forgot about those. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, and those you could, you could easily overlook if you're playing a game that was built for it with a, the, a controller in mind because those buttons probably aren't going to be really be mapped to anything. Um, but uh, when you're playing a game that has many, many different like keyboard and mouse inputs that are possible... Like um, Amnesia. Yeah, or or like Civ Five, you can do interesting things with it. So like, um, with the the default layout that I 
discovered and, and mostly kept exactly the same um, is uh, the uh, right grip uh, button is essentially enter, which uh, almost always will end your turn um, unless there's some critical thing that you have to do, you know, like yeah. like choosing a production or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then the left grip is escape. So going into getting out of menus um, and stuff like that. Um, very, very nice to have those shortcuts available um, and, and, you know, you, w you wouldn't expect that normally when using a controller, you usually think that I'm going to have to sacrifice that kind of, uh, that kind of convenience in order to sit back and relax on my couch and play Civilization V. But that is not the case <laughs> with the Steam controller. You can be lazy and enjoy your game too. Mm -hmm. 12 feet away. Yeah. And, um, actually it's really nice that the controller comes with this, uh, you know, USB, um, extension cable on which to put your the the dongle for the controller so that you can set that like away from any other electronics uh in an area that has like line of sight mm -hmm. to the controller um so you can make sure that you have good uh good signal um and so far i haven't had any any real connectivity issues um i did have one time where we were trying to play left for dead 2 and the control bindings just kept disappearing for the controller. It was really strange. Turns out Steam had crashed in the background that huh. we hadn't noticed, uh, which is kind of important when you're using the Steam controller because um, that's the first layer before it even you know sends the the key uh, commands to Windows and to the game. It goes through Steam. Um, That'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> which which is uh, one of the other kind of disadvantages of the system uh, right now is that I, I'm pretty sure it only supports Steam games at this point. Um, support is coming for non-Steam games, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you'll like have to launch the games through Steam as a shortcut or something like that. Um, we'll see. We'll see. They they are constantly adding new features to it. Um, a recent firmware update uh, brought the feature where I could change. Uh, the the sounds that the controller makes when you start it up and shut it down, which was delightful because I was going through this list and most of it is just kind of abstract, you know, phone ringtone type stuff. And what did you pick? And uh, well, I chose the one called Triumph. Do 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 do. <gasps> Come again. It was a reference to uh, uh, Still Alive from Portal. This was a triumph. Oh, okay, I get it. Yep. Do 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 do. Which I, I I squealed in in ecstasy when I when I uh, stumbled across that one, and I I'm pretty sure you heard it because uh, I was downstairs and then you were upstairs and I just heard you yelling, "What the heck happened?" <laughs> After I was done making noise, I mean, you do get a little loud. Maybe it's not a bad thing. Though. No, no, he gets loud when he has ecstasy. Great. There you go. Um. So yeah, uh, Steam Machines... Less interesting. Less interesting to me, especially because we already have a Windows computer hooked up to our television. But in themselves, yep. is also less interesting. Yeah. There's not too much to say about a semi-expensive computer doing the same thing any other computer you could make yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Also runs Linux. Yeah, exactly. Except compatibility. But I suppose uh, we but can you still could, do that. You could still do that, mm. probably for cheaper, maybe, and maybe. it wouldn't necessarily have to run Linux then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can't, uh, if you buy a Steam machine, you can totally just install Windows on it if you want. Yeah, but, but then you might as well just not do that. Right. Yeah. Um, much more interesting to me is the Steam Link, um, which is the version that's only meant for streaming. Um, so it's super stripped down. I, I don't remember how much it costs, um, but, you know, it seems like it's the Chromecast of the uh, gaming world um, in a much better way than, like, the uh, NVIDIA Shield yeah. Android TV set-top boxes. Man, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we haven't really had any hands-on with any of those, so we no. can't really say how, how nice they are. Yeah. Um, Double five. Yeah. They decided that, uh, hey, we've, we've been doing this Kickstarter thing for a while. Um, it's been going pretty well. We've been, we've been able to make a few projects that we otherwise wouldn't have. Why don't we just start our own crowdfunding thing? Um, so they started Fig, which is... Uh, a crowdfunding platform that only runs one project at a time. So only one game at a time is there. Um, and uh, I, think they've, I think they've done like three games so far. Um, right now they've got Psychonauts 2 going, um, which is really exciting for me. Um, 
And the other the other exciting thing about it is that um, not only uh, can you can you back the project and get like um, just a reward that you already know about, um, but you can uh, back it in an equity sense. Uh, where you get a stake in the in the game itself, and depending on how well the game performs after it's launched, um, how many sales it gets, you will get a cut of the profits. How investment works. Register as an investor. Review terms and tell us the amount you want to invest. Transfer funds to a Squirrel account, and then share in revenue generated by the game. And then it also says that funding is all or nothing, so investments are returned if a campaign does not reach its goal, in case you guys were wondering about that. Oh, right, right, yep. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I might have to start, you know, investing in some of these things. Yep, and and I remember when they first launched, they were talking about how at this point only, like, according to U.S. law, there's only a certain category of people who are allowed to invest in things, um, and they were working on getting around that for Fig. I'm not sure if they have gotten around it by now, um, but ho- hopefully regular Joes like you and I will be able to invest in games that we think are going to be successful. I am the milkman. Sorry. Totally out of context. All right. <laughs> Sorry, psychonauts. Um, it's fine. Speaking of psychonauts, by the way, that that investment as of today, which is what? whatever whatever New Year's Eve is called, I whatever, don't know what day that is. Okay, fine. As of New Year's Eve, um, there will be eleven days left. Okay. Yep. In that campaign, and they're a little bit less than three hundred thousand dollars short. Yeah. So they they've re- they've raised just over three million. And they're going for through three point three million, which is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Sorry, one of the one of the referen- the thing that I had said is I am the milkman because that's a reference to the original Psychonauts game. Plus, that's one of the levels um, that you can donate at, you can invest in for Psychonauts two. Speaking of Psychonauts, I should probably play through the original now that I have uh, controllers available for doing that because that game was you know originally built for Xbox and uh, it feels really strange to play it on keyboard and mouse. Yes. It's not undoable, but it, it just feels strange. I heard the game was good, and I just don't watch TV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how about this? Uh, th- I think this was one that you were really excited about, Ian. Humble Monthly. Well, I'm not sure I was saying that I was super excited about it, but I definitely brought it up when we were talking about game stuff. So um, we've been talking about, well, monthly subscription things, so like Loot Crate. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Oh, what are some of the snacky ones that we do? Uh, Nature Box. Nature Box. You know, all these things that uh, you hear about by uh, listening to podcasts, mm-hmm. and normally they are sponsored uh, advertisements, but uh, in this case, we're just talking about them because we can't get sponsors. No. Nope. No. Hi, viewers. Oh, never mind. I, I mean, oh, well. Um, so, Humble Bundle, you guys know Humble Bundle, I'm assuming. Yes? Yes. Um, Humble Bundle has come up with a Humble Monthly subscription thing where they send games to your inbox every month. Um, all you have to do is subscribe before the first of the next month to get the next bundle. It is currently $12 per month. I'm not sure if there's a big... Um, um, like if you can sign up for a full year and get a, a discount oh, or things like that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, from what I'm seeing, it looks like it could be Journey-esque stuff because that's what the art style is looking for january 1st to receive the next bundle no that's oh shoot what's the one where you create a village or you are gods it's like gaius or something goddess no not goddess anyway um but so on the previous bundle from december there was payday 2 banished rust chroma squad neon struct and company of heroes 2 so there was a lot of actually big games in that one um and i'm assuming that they're going to keep on doing things like that um, so if you like video games and you like supporting the Humble Bundle, then go and do it. Yep. Um, all right. Want to Mi- talk about Microsoft? Yeah, let's talk about Microsoft. Okay. Let's start with the most forgettable thing. Windows 10. Really? Is that, is that really so forgettable? Well, uh, how many people have Windows 10 right now? All of us. Mm-hmm. Well, that's pretty forgettable. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I, I guess Windows 10 is in a hard spot. It's nothing to write home about because they didn't make a billion dollars from it because they gave it away for free. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, a lot of people took it up and then they were really angry because uh, Microsoft was tracking them, allegedly. And then they promptly forgot that they were being tracked because something else happened in their lives that they cared more about. You know, uh, Microsoft has a hard time with this kind of thing. And... Uh, I guess they they've recovered pretty well from their Windows 8 troubles. Yeah, 
Uh, I mean, I haven't seen the the same kind of backlash uh, about Windows 10 the way that we saw about Windows 8 a few years ago. Yep. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a bumpy road when we were trying to get all these computers updated and installed cleanly mm-hmm. from 8 to 10 or 7 to 10. That's true. But it's been, you know, better since then. We've also gone through our first major update. The first, I guess it's called Threshold 2, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's the first up major update. And so we'll see what the business model for Windows is like going forward. Hopefully it doesn't turn into a subscription service. I, I will not. That'd be awful. Not subscribing. Hopefully it doesn't also turn into a hundred dollars every other year kind of thing that would also be awful yeah i'm i mean if if the way that they handled the upgrade to windows 10 is any indication of what they intend going forward um is just any new computers are you're going to have to pay for windows but once it has windows you just get you just get all the updates the same model that apple uses for the most part yeah exactly right and i think that's that's a good model for them hopefully windows the Windows team and Microsoft overall is okay making that change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think uh, it's also interesting that Windows 10 has done away with the, with those RT and non-RT distinctions. Mm. And that's very important because RT flopped and is Hard. not coming back. So aren't we happy now? Even the version of the Surface that was running on RT. Yep. That was uh, done. Whew. So that brings us to the Surfaces, I guess. Yeah. The surfaces are doing pretty well. There's two new major surfaces, I guess, right? I mean, there's three really, but yeah, um, two so, of them are the so same. So the Surface Pro Four and the uh, Surface is, Four, yeah, those are the ones that look similar and familiar to uh, the surfaces that we've already seen, right? Um, quite a bit. It's really weird to think of the surfaces as familiar. Uh, I've never <laughs> used one in more than just passing. Yeah, uh, I think the the most that I've really seen uh, a surface uh, would be on NFL. Oh, like one of those sponsored deals? Uh, well, because, I mean, it, they, you remember when Steve Ballmer yeah, bought... Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, wait, he bought a basketball team. Never mind. Close enough. Um, but it, a while ago, they, they got the Surface to be the official computer of right. the NFL. And they called it iPads. Who did? The, the com- I will commentators. I them down. Yeah they, they, uh, yeah, they were calling them iPads. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, iPads. so in addition to the Surface... Pro for they also have a new item in the lineup, which mm-hmm. is the Surface Book, which is allegedly the nicest computer anybody has ever used ever. Yeah, uh, I got to try one out for like ten minutes at the Microsoft Store at, at the Mall of America. Yeah, um, it was really funny because uh, somebody actually had to come and restart it for me because when I was like, yeah, because when, when you when you uh, unhook it from yeah, yeah, its yeah. base and everything and you know stuff, um, something happened and it uh, refused to flip. It kind of was frozen. Um, so did they say anything or this an the representative yeah. or I, I don't know that he was just like, Oh, that's uh mm, let's yeah, yeah, hold okay. down the power button. Oh. There. And I was like, Oh, I yeah. found a bug. you know, that's, 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 that's this thing that happens, you know, new hardware always has bugs like mm-hmm. that. You know, just never know about, I think the interesting about the surface book pro surface book, pro surface, just the surface, surface book. book. Yeah. Where's the pro version? Oh, I think that's my problem with it. It costs $1,500. I believe mm-hmm. it's really expensive. And isn't it funny that Microsoft is now in the position to make their first party product charge a boatload of money and then still have all those people who back in the old days said Apple was evil because they're charging $1,500 for a joke hardware and it's no better than what I could make for $500 on, with Windows. Mm. So Yeah, except uh, that nobody ever made a Windows laptop that was nearly as nice. Yeah, at, but and that, isn't it funny that we have now flipped into the position where Microsoft is the expensive one and Apple is the, like, eh, I can afford that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I think it's an interesting change after years and years of the reverse being true. Yeah. Okay, how about business? But- <laughs> We changed it again. <laughs> All right. Um, so Yahoo is splitting. Splitting uh, up on Yahoo. Uh huh. Oh no! It's a bad breakup. So the the company is uh, going to well, if everything goes according to the plan that they've come up with, you know, pen, pending all of the people, legal agreements, yeah, you know, yeah, that. stuff like that. Um, the plan is that they are going to be splitting into two different companies. One of which is going to just be uh, the owner of the stocks that they have in Alibaba. Al- yeah, that one. Um, and, and the other is going to have all of the stuff, the consumer facing stuff that we associate with Yahoo. So um, your Yahoo News, the Yahoo search engine, um, Tumblr, Flickr. Uh, what other, What else does Yahoo own? Whatever they do. Yeah. Yahoo Mail. I'll, oh, that, that. Yep. That's a big one. Um, I'm sure there are other Yahoo properties that I just don't know about. And that goes to show that Yahoo sucks. Mm-hmm. 
Nothing to do with Qualcomm this time. It's their own fault. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a shame that Marissa Mayer could not turn Yahoo around like everybody had dreamed. Mm-hmm. It, it turns out that working at the best company in the world called Google isn't a one-way ticket to success. It also turns out that making a well-named semi-tech evangelist celebrity person, Marissa Mayer, making her a CEO isn't a one-way ticket to saving your company. Right. When your company is Yahoo and really has no room for something new. There there were many attempts. Uh, do you recall there was a Yahoo browser that they made at one point? For real? Yeah, when under um, under Mayor, there was a browser for iOS. I, don't, I think it was called Access or something. It lasted for about a week, and then it was gone pretty much. Um, I That's think why that, we don't remember it. Exactly. <laughs> I think there were other big things that she tried to do. Um, you know, certain Yahoo properties are fine. You know, Flickr's fine, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, they bought Tumblr. Mm-hmm. But... What happens to all of that now after after all this ends up happening? We don't know yet. In 2016, it's not going to be better for Yahoo. It's going to be worse. And so I hope I hope all of you Tumblr evangelists figure out a way to start a WordPress blog because you're going to need to do it soon. <laughs> I really, really hope that somebody finds a way to um, save Flickr from this burning wreckage. Uh, I, I think Flickr itself could probably be profitable. Yeah. I have no doubt probably. that it could be a standalone, its own business probably sort of yeah. there's probably a lot of bandwidth costs there but we'll see yeah and especially since they um give everybody a terabyte of storage hey, for their all photos. they need to do is buy an audio streaming service and then take out the ads of Flickr when you bundle oh oh, no. oh <laughs> i see what you did there yeah okay it's not gonna work out nice. yeah uh, let's see what else we've got blackberry Yes. Uh, so BlackBerry, for the first time ever, uh, is profitable has... again. No. 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 They, they, are they? they? They are now more profitable than they were, you know, last year's quarter. Huh. Okay. And it is because of the BlackBerry Priv. That's right. Um, is this the first time that they've come out with a like an actual Android phone? I believe this is the first full Android phone. There w- was the BlackBerry Z10 that could run Android apps, but it wasn't itself ah, Android. Ah. Okay. Yep. Um. So yeah, the the BlackBerry Priv is uh, a phone that that runs almost stock Android, um, but uh, they the they hard- need some improvements to you know some additions. Oh sure sure yeah. Um, and on the hardware side, they they kind of brought their their BlackBerry expertise on on keyboards yes. uh, to the table. And in general, just making good hardware. Mm-hmm. So every, everybody likes the Priv that has tried it. You know there are bugs, of course, in every operating system launch uh, with the custom hardware. But for the most part, it's been very positive. There has been some concerns that, you know, the the Priv has, you know, impacted their revenues. So they are making more money. They are more profitable. So that's good. But it's not just the Priv. It's also some other enterprise service thing that they're doing. But mm-hmm. it's been cautioned that we shouldn't be too optimistic about the Priv. Because according to Google Play Store numbers, where the apps that BlackBerry wrote, there's only, you know, 75,000 downloads. Uh. So does that mean there's only 75,000 Priv sold? Or does that mean... That people suck and just don't know how to update their phones. But if you were buying a Priv in the first place, how aren't you an enthusiast and how wouldn't you update immediately? <laughs> yeah, I, actually, would those numbers include like the units that were manufactured and you know and it supposedly should, had to download? It should the, be the units because they're flashed. Presumably, the app is flashed uh, yeah. onto the device. Yep. And then once it's unboxed and connected to Wi-Fi, it should just update. Okay. But it there could be reasons. Right. We don't know. But but BlackBerry, it's going to be a big thing in 2016. They're Blackberry. making a new, smaller end device, like you know the Priv is big. They're going to make a new mm-hmm. mid, middle range kind of a Moto G class device, okay. allegedly. And if it's good and not crippled by the um, Qualcomm bug, it could be great. I'm hopeful for them. I am extremely hopeful that we get a device that's mid range that's better than a Moto G finally after years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that I'm saying that you know, but the first time in a very long time. Uh, I'm actually excited for BlackBerry, and it, all, BlackBerry. It, all it took was for them to come out with a Nexus device isn't with, that a, funny? with a keyboard. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that funny? And and so the, the 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 Priv is you know supposed to be secure and super duper great and wonderful. So hopefully they keep that going and we all enjoy it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now we probably could have talked about this under under Google. Um, but, but we it, couldn't really because it has nothing to do with Google. No, it's over Google. It's over Google. <laughs> There's no such thing. But there is. Actually, technically. Why? Yes. So, uh, earlier this year... For some reason... Google decided... Well, Larry Page decided... Yeah, well. That uh, they were going to split the company up 
into a bunch of different smaller companies and then owned them under one bigger company. Yeah. So the the company that was formerly known as Google is now known as Alphabet. And the part of Google, the old Google, that we know from the consumer standpoint, so you know the search, the part that Android, had, uh, Chrome, Gmail, Chrome, yep, you know all the stuff. Brand. Yeah, yeah, that part of the company was going to be known as Google. So now so, CEO'd by uh, Sundar Pichai. Yep, and the other branches, such as their Calico branch, which is their long life, longevity mm-hmm. serum branch, their robotics branch. Um, self-driven cars self-driven car branch uh who else uh the wait. space mining branch i don't know if that's the thing wait longevity serum they've been working on a longevity serum well yep. it's it's longevity long life thing yeah um they've been doing a lot of different things so all of their other things those are being pushed into their own project loon yes stuff that, like that. Yep. nest is its own company now under oh. alphabet oh um so so all of those companies now have a place of their own under a bigger corporate entity and they're all ceo'd independently mm-hmm under the guidance of the super CEO, I guess. Larry Page. Yeah. Overlord so, Larry Page. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much at this point. Basically, they, they're taking a very hands-off approach. They're just saying, you know, if you want help, let us know. We'll come down, give you a hand, and walk back up to our office and take a nap. And part of part of the thought process behind that is that uh, it, when, when people see some of these crazy projects, um, they didn't necessarily want them to be associated with the Google name. Right. Just quite yet. Yeah. Right. Not until they were they were more fleshed out and ready to be actually uh, introduced to consumers mm-hmm. as a like, hey, look at this thing that we made for you. There you go. So I, I have two thoughts on that then. In recent articles from the Wall Street Journal and other places, I've been noticing that some writers have been saying Google, a subsidiary of Alphabet or Alphabet's Google company. And I'm like. Come on, we all know the truth here. Go away and stop writing this so terribly. Um, in addition to that, I think it's really interesting from a marketing standpoint that Google knows that the future cannot just be search and cannot just be Android and cannot just be Google browsing or and it can't just be what they do now. Mm-hmm. They know they have these other things and they know that Google might not be forever. So instead, let's make up a, a bunch of little companies so that if we need different brands, we have them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about uh, the government a little bit. Yes. Um, this is something, yeah, they, they well, they, they do make their way into a lot of the news that we talk about um, because a lot of the things that we talk about require regulations. Um, really? Yeah. Hmm. Well. Yeah. Um, so in particular this year, the FCC uh, started uh, really properly regulating net neutrality issues. I remember watching the vote on that day mm-hmm. when the world was saved. Yeah. When the United States was saved. Oh wait, but nothing changed. Okay, it was I kind got of it. bizarre uh, to to watch. Actually, I don't know. I guess sort of. Well, because because like uh, all five of the people uh, essentially already knew how everybody was going to yeah. vote. Was, I remember you know... the 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 Indian guy saying no. I don't I don't mm-hmm. know any of their names except Wheeler. Uh, yeah, um, but yeah. So so they they had this legally. They had to have a publicly facing right. like uh, hearing about it, right? And yeah. then they were all going to vote and everything. Um, so all five of the members of the board got to make statements and stuff, but none of them were actually trying to convince anybody else on the board of anything show. because they knew that how everybody was going to vote and they knew they were go- weren't going to be able to convince each other. So it was a lot of just like weird speech stuff yeah, that didn't make a difference. No. Um, I, mean, I guess that's just what the organization does and how the government works here. Yeah. Sure. In America. Um, but yeah, so, so they, they uh, voted to regulate um, internet providers under Title II of the Telecommunications Act. Um, so, they, so, so they're able to make uh, actually effective rules regarding um, net neutrality issues. Yes. Uh, you know, how, how information is treated as it travels through the network. Um, Dependent, you know, and I believe the the lawsuit that was the cause of all this last time is now being redecided upon right now with the course. new rules, and so we don't know the answer yet. But sometime in 2016, we'll finally get an answer. Hopefully, it's a good answer. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it'll probably just go to the Supreme Court, and it'll be even longer, and then we'll probably get a bad answer, depending on who wins the election and uh, various things, yeah. all ending in bad things. Hopefully, the statements made by the Supreme Court, if it goes that far, uh, will be more interesting than the speeches that we saw from the board members of you the know, FCC. You know, maybe it will, but maybe it won't. You know, it's 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 very difficult to say right now. Net neutrality is one of those, um, like uh, nebulous concepts. It is, but also one of those um, 
partisan concepts for a lot sure. of people. You know, the Democratic side says, yay, regulation. And the Republicans are like, no, I don't like Democrats. Whatever they want, none of that. Mm-hmm. And because they don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. So it's a very difficult thing to talk about in the future when the people who want it, or people also know how it works and what it means. And the people who don't want it have no clue and don't really care. Just They just don't want to do it because other people do want it. Right. It, it'd be interesting to see... Um, cause, cause net neutrality is kind of an obscure concept. Right. Um, so if, if we were able to introduce it to enough people, uh, you know, before, before it was they polarized. get, yeah, before they get hit with the government regulation right. or not government regulation angle of the argument, yeah. uh, you know, how, wh- where people would fall, uh, I think they would fall where you would expect them to fall. Man, that sounds awful. Yeah. And then once they hear that a Democrat likes it or a Republican doesn't like it, they'll know their side based on that alone. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, Drones? Yes, the uh, drones have become quite the hot topic uh, in in our culture. You might say they're a high flyer. Yes. Um, so the, the FAA has, uh, come up with some regulations on drones. And I think they're just proposed regulations so far. Ye- well, uh, so there's at least, at least some the registry is isn't up yet. Is, right? Isn't it? No, you, I think you do have to register, okay. uh, if you got a drone. Um, I, I think they made sure to get that done before the holiday season. Okay. Maybe that, year. that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the way, the way that I understand that it works is if you are 13 or older and you have a mm-hmm. drone, you have to register with it. Um, that registration costs $5. Um, and that will allow, I, th- I think most of the other regulations aren't really in place other than like the, uh, can't fly it over 400 feet right. and yep. can't fly it within five miles of an airport. Right. Um, and, uh, and part of the, the point of having people register it is so that, um, they can get the word out to these people when they make more regulations, right. when, when, yeah. when the rules change or whatever. And it's also, I think you also have to inscribe your, your number that they give you, like a serial number, onto ah. the thing. So when it A, gets shut down, or B, hits something important, mm-hmm. we can find out who you are. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's going to stop everyone. You know, people will just not register or say, I didn't know about that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just going to be like anything else. Welcome to Issues with Gun Control. Mm-hmm. It was really interesting um, to find out that uh, all national parks are no-fly zones. Which is um, weird. Yeah, and uh, and apparently a lot of people don't know that. So there have been not a surprised. lot of I would issues. have never assumed that, that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, it's a lovely place to take pictures with a drone. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I also saw a tweet a few weeks ago that it's funny how we have to register for little itty-bitty drones, but we don't have to register for relatively large guns. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In America. That's, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Talking well, about polarizing th- issues. Yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of polarizing issues. <laughs> <laughs> we have... At least one more coming up. Yeah. Do we want to talk about the second one? Um, I'm game if you're game. Sure, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first up, uh, some scary, scary primaries going on right now oh, for God. the presidential campaign. So so far, we we are right now are on New Year's Eve. Have heard how many debates of various from various sources? Oh, goodness, we've had at least three or four Republican debates, and, and, and I think two, three, two or three. three. Three Democratic debates. Yeah. So there's a lot of debates, mm-hmm. and encryption and the internet and technology has been included in some of those debates. Mm-hmm. So the one I am very passionate about is the one about encryption. Okay. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, having backdoors installed in various encryptions across the internet and devices. So... You know, there was this uh, Paris bombing and terrorist attack, and initial reports reported that they were using encrypted end-to-end encrypted services. But it turns out they were using SMS, and anybody could have been intercepted if they had been looking. But, oh, wait, there's too much. What can I do? Oh, crap. So here in America, there's been talk from the Apple about how, no, we can't, we can't give you a backdoor. It just won't work. It's encrypted. And then we have nothing to do with it. We can't give you the keys. We can't give you the data because it won't do anything. And... There's the, from from both sides of the aisle, from the Democrats and for the Republicans, they both say we just need to have the technology people make a backdoor, make a solution that works. Just let them handle that. They know how and they're just not cooperating enough right now or they haven't been asked to cooperate in the way we would like. And, you know, as you might have heard, I'm a computer scientist. I tend to somewhat know a little bit a little bit of the technical implementations of these things. It's very hard to have a backdoor in the way they would like. Yeah. No. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, under Bill Clinton won, 
assuming there is no Bill Clinton 2, there was a mock implementation of an encryption algorithm that allowed a backdoor to exist for it. It was provided to the government. You know, it was one of those encryptions that wasn't an ARM. Mm-hmm. So AES is an ARM, RSA is an ARM. You can't export it outside the country, allegedly. Oh, okay. So this one could be exported outside the country because the government had all the keys. Mm. Yeah. Well, then we liked it, and we don't use it anymore, turns yeah. out. And it's going to be the same thing over and over again until this stops happening. Encryption isn't the problem. Yeah, and I mean, even even if uh, it were possible to make a nice, you know, reasonable encryption system that had a backdoor that only the government could access, and there's no uh, risk of anybody else being able to use that backdoor, um, what's to stop these bad people from just making their own encryption system? Exactly. Which you could do, because you could just go to your local, I don't know, academic library called the University of Anywhere Mm -hmm. and read the paper or the book on how to make AES or RSA encryption. And hey, look, there you go. Done. In in addition to that, uh, there is no good way to make a three key encryption. So, you know, there's public private, but there's no good way to make a public private private. Mm. And that means this won't work. Right. I don't know. I mean, I don't. Sorry. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lounging back behind the microphone. Not a problem. Um, I don't really know much about encryption and computer science stuff. So Not a problem. That's a little over my head. That's, that is fine. That's how normal people view it. I just hope that you take your privacy and security seriously and you don't let the government trample all over the things that you like. That's why I have him here, because he can tell me, hey, this is being a bad idea, don't do it, and I can go, okay. This is why I have Ryan here, so I can uh, talk to him about it and go, hey, Ryan, is this a good idea? And I'm going to tell you maybe. (laughs) So the other thing in the primaries and debates recently has been closing the internet. And and, and I don't know about you, but I, I personally don't think that you can close the internet in the way that some people might like. And um, you can't close the internet in just a local area. Yeah, no. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah so so can, can you go over exactly what they have been talking about? So in this there subject? is a certain person called Trump uh-huh. who has stated that he would like to close the internet in places where there's a lot of terrorist activity. And that might be Syria, might be Iraq, might be Afghanistan. I don't know the geographical details of problematic states. However... I know that you cannot specifically close the internet to prevent people from the United States from reading content from other countries like that. Because A, the content might not even be hosted in that country, Mm because the last time I checked, Syria is not the place I would have a server, fear of getting it bombed, shot, or otherwise attacked. Mm -hmm. I would have it in a nice quiet place like Austin, Texas. Lovely place to have a server. That's where my server is. Hey. Um, And so... It turns out closing the internet is very difficult. The NSA has tried, and they have messed up numerous times to close major backbones of the internet for various political reasons. Turns out, when you try messing with router firmware, and you have no way to restart the router, you can brick it, and somebody might notice. So, closing the internet will not work, and it is not a problem of getting the smart people together and asking them to cooperate. It is a technical problem. And I understand the technical things are difficult to understand for people who aren't technical, Mm -hmm. like some people. And that's fine. But at some point, you have to agree that this is too hard for me to understand, and I'm going to leave it to somebody who does understand to go and do it. Now, I don't even understand all of the actual technical things of encryption or the technical details of BGP routing and how all those systems work necessarily. But I understand enough to know that it cannot be done without breaking even more things. And even from like a conceptual standpoint, I just I I don't stand for the concept of closing the internet. You know, like because um, being somebody who who grew up uh, in the in the aughts is that what they're we're calling them now sure. the the two thousands before the tens. Um, they, okay. <laughs> um, I've I've come to associate myself more as a citizen of the internet than as a citizen of the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of. Which is why it, it really pisses me off when I go traveling to like Sweden and it's like, oh, I don't have access to my Prime uh, right. videos now. Because uh, your intellectual property isn't your intellectual property. Yeah. Um, things things like that. You know, I, I really believe in uh, in um, yeah, just just. Uh, agnostic distribution is that how we should i mean describe maybe it? i i guess it's it's just um 
some you could describe it like that you could describe it pretty much any word that makes sense with freedom and choice yeah. and yeah and unalteredness mm-hmm. i don't know there's a lot of different virtues you might associate it with equality yes that too you know, it, it's it's a very nuanced conversation to have because you can quickly make a bunch of examples that sound like, hey, yeah, this is totally a bad idea. You know, like nobody should be reading terrorist websites in fear of getting indoctrinated into it. But why? That's a problem. That's a social problem. That's not really a technical problem. Mm-hmm. That That's what I would think. Um, I don't think gun control is a technical problem. I think it's a social problem. Cool. Great. I don't think a lot of things are technical problems. Technically, we can't do anything about it. But socially, we could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so closing the internet isn't a solution. Banning internet encryption, banning any encryption isn't a solution. Some other solution needs to be found instead. Yeah. Trying trying to prevent people from accessing ideas isn't isn't the way to go about it. Right. But presenting better ideas, I think, is the way to go about it. Man, we That's are so... The way to go about it. You know, you said this to me once. I'm glad you feel comfortable enough to say that. And that's... you You tweet at me in my head every time I think something could be good for the world and I'm like, oh crap. Never mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Again, that's why I keep him around. It's my job to make the bad decisions. His job to tell me why they're bad. Good. Sure. Okay. Keep, keep staying around. <sighs> okay. Uh, Next. Last thing. Next. Oh, <laughs> last thing. Oh God. Um, I guess actually this doesn't really have to do anything with tech stuff because um, I thought that we were just talking about governance. So that's why I threw this up here. Sure. Um, because with scary primaries and the last guy who we were talking about, Trump and all his idiocies, um, well, I guess many points of idiocy and the many things that I don't like about him and fear mongering and whatnot. Right. Um, some of the, another one of the very polarizing political issues that's going on right now is the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, personally, I've, I've been, teeter-tottering back and forth on how I feel about the movement as a whole. I know one thing that I have always said and always will say is that I stand behind their, um, their message. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and I mean, it took me a little while to figure out why, why all lives matter versus black lives matter was a big deal. Yeah. What the um, distinction is there. Yeah. Um, because as, as other people have put it, it's not that we're saying, all lives don't matter. It's we're saying that all lives do matter. We're just focusing on the black ones right now. Um, Which is necessary given the climate that we're in. Yes. So, um, but it's, it's more the tactics of the black lives matter group. And is that what we need to make, make those goals, that message unachievable thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so sort of like you were talking about, is it a technical issue or is it a social issue? Is it something that we can make happen with laws um, or is it something that we have to change the overall as a society? Mm-hmm. Um, and how do we go about doing that? And is what they're doing a way that, a way that is productive in that sense? Um, I mean, I still don't entirely know. I think it's definitely a social issue. It's definitely a social issue. Um, but I mean, as, as to where are they on the right track that I, I'm still sort of teetering in between. Mm-hmm. Um, because the way that they're doing stuff is definitely incredibly disruptive. Which at this point I think is needed to gain attention and garner attention, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise it's just going to keep keep on getting swept under the rug. Sort of like how with the all lives matter thing, we we one of the ways that we sort of hide racism in this country and that's made it such a big problem is by making blanket blanket statements um, and telling people to shut up whenever we say whenever they say that hey something is being something is being bad. Sorry, something bad is happening to me, mm-hmm. and we we oh I should, sorry I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> um, yeah the so the thing that you said about um being disruptive yeah. um kind of struck a chord with me because I remember um during the what was it the state fair mm-hmm. uh this year or last year or something yeah it was this year. it must have been this year yeah. yeah um that they had some pretty big protests at the at the minnesota state fair big and well okay yeah, yeah. um shut shut down uh, some of the entrances for a little while yep. while they were marching around and stuff um and i remember yeah seeing seeing tweets about like okay so so yeah their message is great but like do they have to inconvenience everybody at the fair this way um in order to get the point across um and i i thought that was a a really interesting thing to say because oh gosh i'm so minnesotan i use the word interesting mm-hmm. um it was you know cuz yeah you you can get frustrated when it's inconveniencing you but like 
that's the thing. It's an inconvenience, mm-hmm. right? You know, as opposed to uh, the the issues that they're trying to talk about, which is life and death. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, I I obviously when when the only way to uh, get people to acknowledge that there's a problem um, and to have a conversation about it is to inconvenience that with them. Go go for it. Do that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I mean, it's also the yeah the question of how is it perceived though by the people who are inconveniencing them, and how do we That's, get them to change their perception? Exactly. Yeah. It's it's hard to get people on your side when you're inconveniencing them at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because I know from from a lot of the people who are being inconvenienced, it, it seems like it's it's something that's done out of frustration, out of, out of anger, mm-hmm. um, which it is, but it's, it's not necessarily a bad anger, but I also stand by the, the thought that anger begets more anger if it's not dealt with in a productive mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, it's, yes, it's a matter of helping people. How do they perceive what the message is and getting that across? Um, I, I also remember uh, kind of early on in the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign, um, there were a few rallies where um, the whole thing was was disrupted. And I think they had to cut one or two of them short because uh, Black Lives Matter protesters were uh, or demonstrators, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. uh, kind of took over the stage um, and they, you know, they couldn't continue with the planned program. Um, and and they were doing that at the time because they they didn't feel that the Bernie Sanders um, um, campaign had had put any like concrete statements or plans or anything in on the table um regarding the police brutality issue um and so so it 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 had the effect of uh kind of dividing uh people's opinions between like okay well i I really really like bernie sanders they're disrupting bernie sanders's events i think less of the black lives matter uh movement now Mm -hmm. um kind of thing so it's it's uh Perception. Yeah. Perception is a big thing, mm-hmm. especially in politics. So I think there was a, a recent protest from Black Lives Matter, and they disrupted airport traffic. Yep. Oh, boy. MSP. Specific. Yep. Uh, and, and that was uh, a pretty egregious kind of thing. Uh, my aunt is staying here over Christmas and a little bit of New Year's. And so she wasn't affected, luckily. But if she had been flying in that day, that would have been obnoxious to deal with. And I guess for me... Um, inconveniencing people is not my methodology of changing people's minds. I would prefer, you know, you know, well, cr- well-crafted media mm-hmm. to do it. That's that's where I come from. That's our background. Uh, that's my background. Maybe that's yours. Uh, hopefully, as a as a person who listens to the podcasts and who produces some tarp, some sort of media and who appreciates blogging and the web in general, a person should find an avenue that isn't disruptive. But that is convincing, and that uses presumably something like facts, if not um, rose-tinted opinions, to convince me of it. I mean, even even an emotional appeal is, is, is yeah. something. Yeah. Tony twenty twelve. Do you remember that? How right. effective that was? I sort of don't remember what that was about. I have no idea what it was about. Still, I, I <laughs> heard the there. phrase all over the place, but I still don't know what it was. I there, had I had a poster. I stole it from a sign. There there was a video that was put out by. I don't remember his name, but he was later shown for being a bit of a fraud. Um, but so it was talking about Joseph Coney, who was this, um, this militant group leader over in, um, somewhere in Africa. Okay. And he was taking children and training children to be child, child soldiers. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the reasons why he wasn't really, nobody was going against him is because it wasn't being brought to light. Okay. What he was doing. Um, and so that campaign was set up to try and get more people to go and donate. And I saying I'm saying this with air quotations, um, money to try and bring him to light and then get him to justice. Okay. Is what it was, but it, it made that huge emotional appeal mm-hmm. to people. So yeah, it can definitely work as a media thing. Mm-hmm. So, so when you air quote donate, that means that the donations weren't actually going to the exact place that people thought they were. I don't believe so. Okay. No. So I guess what I want from the movements instead of this disruptive behavior is more of a media centric approach where, you know, you can do your Coney like signs in physical, but you also use released videos and you, you, you get a statements from people and you actually make media, whether that be on YouTube or blog posts or whatever, and you actually do something with that. And then you can go and rally around your Capitol building or your, uh, 
annoying police precinct or whatever, you can go and do that, but you also have to provide something for me to read or watch to understand something else. Mm -hmm. And don't bother people in doing it. So what you're saying is you don't want me to uh, organize a sit-in at the Mall of America to promote the Nexus.tv. Uh, you can do that. You will be arrested yourself because okay. I won't be there. Um, Sorry. It won't be the same without you. Now, what we can do is we can make this room look like Mall of America. We can sit in here and then broadcast it on the local YouTube. You we can do that. How about we skip a couple of steps? I'm sure it'd be easier to make this room look like more of a prison cell than... than <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes. So, yeah, it's it, it's an interesting issue of how do we get people to listen and how do we... How do we um, get people to to actually change their opinions socially without it necessarily being in an angry sort of way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also have to understand our own our own backgrounds coming with this, because as you oh, for said, sure. um, we it's a mild inconvenience for us, whereas it's a matter of life and death for them. And that, I mean, that applies to all of the stuff that we were just talking about in the, especially in the government section. Um, we're three liberal white dudes sitting in a, in a basement talking about it. Yeah. So in America, yes, America. you got to do it right. So there's, there's a lot more to this issue that we probably don't really understand because mm -hmm. we don't have the background. to. And, and I guess that's what I'm asking for. Whatever I don't understand, where is it? Where, where can I go for it now? Like, I've seen your protest. Tell me more. Where? Yeah. It's nowhere. I can't go to blacklivesmatter.com slash tell me more. Does anybody want to fact check that? And if I could, would there be something there for me to read and to understand more about? Mm -hmm. And then what can I do to make it go away to solve their issues? Going to blacklivesmatter.com. I'm sorry, Matthew. This is going on your search history. <laughs> Oh my gosh, his gun search history is also going to be checked heavily on my internet. Oh my gosh. Actually, listening to last year's uh, year-end special, um, he was talking about getting a $600 cannon. And my first thought... Oh, with, uh, with uh, Steven, right? Uh, yes, yes. yes right. And my first thought was, oh, he's getting a nice camera. <laughs> <laughs> because I know that that's a reasonable price range for a nice DSLR. It doesn't wow. seem like it's up. No, and so that is the, that is the, really the ultimate shame. Like, they're... they're what they've done has worked. It's piqued my interest, mm -hmm. but yet has it has let me down in the follow through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, yeah, as I had said, this is where it needs to be now to get their interest. But where yep. do we go from here? Yep. Um, so that's speaking, also from the outside looking in. Yeah. So speaking of media, there's some pretty important uh, fictional things that uh, came out this year. <laughs> important fictional things. <laughs> yes, very important. Just like this show. So, uh, well, this is. And then this network. isn't fiction. This it's is all fiction. Well, whatever. Okay. The ruse. Um, so Star Wars came out. Star Wars: The Force Awakens, the first real Star Wars movie that we've had in ten years. And you know, we had been talking about this. I included in the supercut specifically because I knew this movie was coming out. Was, I think Matt said something about Star Wars, and I included it in there. Nice. I knew. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I don't care either way. But uh, I hear uh, here there's a pretty scathing review over there. Yeah, yeah. You can go and listen to that on uh, uh, the Nexus TV slash so three. Yeah. Um, Savannah and I kind of tear it apart because neither of us were very impressed with it as a movie. You know, something that I really want to see from the next one is I want to hear Han Solo call somebody Junior because I think that'd be hilarious because of the the Indiana Jones reference. Oh yeah. Well, maybe that'll happen um, since they have uh, the standalone Han Solo movie. Coming out in two thousand. Is that what that's about? Two thousand eighteen. I thought it was next year. No, no, no. Um, uh, that one's uh, Rogue One. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, I don't, yeah. I don't. See, I don't. I don't do Star Wars. Junior. I was once told that Iron Man is not a Jedi. That's all I know. <laughs> well, don't worry, uh, Ryan. In about five years, they will be merging the Marvel and Star Wars universes since Disney owns both of them. Did I ever tell you I hate comics? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because uh, when I was making this little brief little list of important media that have come out in the last year, I was trying to think of anything that wasn't Star Wars that you know anything that wasn't like screen based that that yeah, isn't yeah. movies. And uh, I realized that all that I've been doing is reading Star Wars novels and Star Wars comics. That's all you need. So yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that I had an issue with with Star Wars. Actually, nothing that anyone else would really be able to relate to, but I thought that Han Solo actually looked a lot like my grandpa. Huh. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't relate to that. Well, call up Harrison Ford and um, complain. Ask him for the truth. Oh, uh, so the, <laughs> another very, very good movie that came out this year is uh, The Martian. Yes, I think yeah. we were we were all quite impressed with that. And by good movie, I mean uh, I like the book. 
Okay. I listened to it in audiobook form, of course, but I, I maybe sort of pretended to read it. And, uh, you know, when I watch a movie and when I read the book, of course, they're different things mm-hmm. because adaptions mm-hmm. adapt. They don't copy. Um, I guess what I've started to do is like, well, let's just say a different universe had a different take on these events. How mm-hmm. would it play out? Right. And, hey, look, I got two universes. Cool. And they might overlap or they might not. Wonderful. But, man, the book's still better. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. I need okay. to. I still need to read the book as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think the plan is Brian and Brandon and I will be doing kind of probably one of those extra dimensions on the book. Um, second if, opinions. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah, I thought it was an extra dimension. No. Second oh, opinion. Yeah, whatever. I don't know <laughs> what the difference is. I'm not the Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. You're going to have to write that up so I know the directions. Is it a review? Like, you know, you know the thing that's here's, under here? Okay, here's our flow chart. <laughs> is it a review? No. How is it not a review? It's an in-depth analysis. That's a review. Oh, crap. So what's the extra dimension for? Everything that isn't a review. Oh, what isn't a review? Um, well, when we talked about uh, YouTube Red... So if I Red, hadn't read it, it would be an extra dimension. <laughs> I guess? <laughs> well, then why would I be talking about it? <laughs> that face... But I mean, like when when we were talking about um, the the technical boundaries to uh, podcasting or uh, not boundaries, um, obstacles yes, to right. podcasting, yes, right. that wasn't a review of anything. So in conclusion, <laughs> so calls ignored. Uh, do we have anything else to talk about before we leave here today? Have I mentioned that we're trying to be a quality studio these days? <laughs> no, no. See, I think you've put your standards too high. <laughs> Only for things that he actually is in charge of. Oh, I see. Uh, it turns out it was set for one hour. Mm, uh, that's mm-hmm, why it mm-hmm. ended. Silence has ended. Yes. And it was interrupted by the Dave. Which means if silence has ended, then we should also end this show. So I guess that has to bring us to the question of where can we find you on the internet? Uh, well, you can find me, Ian Buck, at Ian R. Buck on Twitter and uh, on Medium. Ooh. Uh, I've been, I'm in the process of, uh, what, what do you call it, migrating my whole blog over to Medium, which is exciting and tedious. I can imagine. Yeah. And uh, and on YouTube as Ian Buck, and hopefully soon I'll have a, a proper website. Yay. I keep talking about that, but, you know, it'll never happen. Why? Because I'm lazy. But I'm done. I can do things now. What? I could host it oh. and everything. Well. Yeah. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. How about you, Ian Decker? Oh, let's see. I'm I'm Bigfoot1138 on Twitter. Um, well, okay, at Bigfoot1138 on Twitter, just Ian Decker on Twitter. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Steam is Bigfoot. I know nothing fancy anymore in the front. I can probably change that back to something worth memorizing. Nothing My, fancy in the front? As in, like, I have no D, DS or anything like that. Oh, that's, okay. Is that a thing? Can, he, how did he change his name? Oh, you, um, you can change that your, is... your tag at, wow. at any time in Steam. Well, that's <laughs> mm-hmm. cool. And it wasn't taken? Um, I don't think it matters if it's taken or not. Um, because there's, so there, there's your permanent username oh. that isn't really public facing okay. and you can change that to whatever the heck you want or yep. you, you can never change your actual username that you log in with. Um, but you can change your tag that you, I see. people see you as on in the community. You're Too complicated for me. Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar, I today have 19,000 tweets. Woo! So partake in the glory of 19,000 tweets. That's and join me on the Twitter and, of course, on the Google+, Plus, which is where I post pictures of many things, such as Christmas holidays, dogs that are sleeping, mostly for Matt, and cats. I almost forgot I'm on Flickr. That's where I put my photography. <laughs> you said that with so much enthusiasm. <laughs> Well, mostly because uh, I have a total of like twenty some pictures on there right now. Um, if that's what it's you, growing. if that's what you decided that looks good, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. What? No. What? I just haven't had time to go and like doctor up the pictures and stuff because mm. I have a job. <laughs> Jobs. Do that during the job. That's what Dave I, would do. I can't because the version of Photoshop that they have at school <gasps> is too old to read the raw camera files from from my D two thirty two hundred. And you wondered what they would do about Sketch. <laughs> That's all I can say. Cool beans. Well, I guess I, we should at, wish everyone a happy new year. Look forward to 2016. Happy new year. Yeah. And happy holidays. And happy new year.
Hello, this is Ryan. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to those on the network who could not make it for the recording of this special. Andrew Bailey, who was out of town, he was unable to uh, attend. Uh, Brandon Johnson and Brian Mitchell, who were also unable to attend. I'm very sorry that you guys weren't around for this. I'm also sorry to Andrew Bailey for not using his contributions to the show notes. Uh, Unfortunately, Ian Buck and Ian Decker and I were not smart enough to include lots of great material to talk about, such as Fallout 4, The Witcher 3, Bob Ross, uh, The New Raspberry Pi, Let's Encrypt, uh, NVIDIA Shield, uh, AMD Fury X, uh, Intel and Micron's new memory, Western Digital and Log Me In and uh, some other finer points about the FCC changes. It's a shame that we weren't able to have you on the show so that you could have instilled your wisdom upon us. And so, very sorry that you couldn't have been here for that. Uh, I did figure, however, that instead of recording more content for this episode, we would just go with what we had because, well, turns out... This episode was an hour and 50 minutes when we stopped recording, and luckily I got it down to just under an hour and a half, so at least you didn't have to listen to too much. So I I do want to wish you a happy new year, and I hope you watch out for cars because they're very dangerous, so have a good one.